everyone, my name is Ella, but you may know me as Scientific Snitch on other platforms. Today we will be reacting to this brief video by Dr. Mike Isertel in order to deconstruct the false and racist claim that race is a biological reality. But before we watch his video, just a brief reminder to like, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to show your support to the channel. Now let's begin. Here is my view in perpetuity until politics changes in at least the United States. This is my view uh, as applied forward for the rest of this channel's lifetime until and unless politics really changes. Here it is. Ready? I 100% acknowledge, because I'm literate, that race is truly a biological construct. It is deep. It pervades almost everything. And, and it has real-world differences in ability that are complicated. They are overlapping in spectra, but they are nonetheless for sure real. And they affect every single thing about your life on the margins. If you ask me any more questions about that, I won't say anything because I'm not getting canceled over that shit. So because I am actually literate in the field of genetics and biomedical sciences, I acknowledge that race is not a biological reality, but a social construct. To provide a brief introduction to what I will be talking about in this video, let's briefly review the history of race as a concept and a few of the major reasons why race is considered a social construct with no true basis in biology or genetics. First, the concept of race did not begin with the field of biology or genetics. The concept of race began with Enlightenment thinkers like Carl Linus under the pseudoscientific veil of biology and genetics, but was really to justify social issues such as colonialism, racism, or racial superiority, and the transatlantic slave trade. Then, under the same pseudoscientific veil of biology and genetics which masked the social issue underpinnings, Buffen and Blumenbach developed hypotheses that would confirm the existing bias that race had biological underpinnings. Unfortunately, the hypotheses made by Buffen and Blumenbach were made prior to our understanding of the field of genetics. After the field of genetics became well established, we found out that humans are incredibly complex organisms that have not spent enough time apart to develop clear-cut biological differences between quote-unquote races. So race-associated physical traits such as muscularity and skin color cannot define races because these traits are not encoded by single genes or groups of genes that only map onto some races and not the others. These vague biological dividers between different races combined with the social construct of race influencing our society eventually led us to find that the higher prevalence of of non-physical traits such as intelligence and athleticism in some races and not others was a product of environmental, socioeconomic, and cultural factors, not biological factors. Basically, there are no biological hard lines that define particular races in humans, and these biological loose lines get crossed all the time as people from different cultures, races, and ethnicities mingle and form romantic partnerships. But as social creatures, the long-standing social construct of race in our society has brewed a higher prevalence of diseases and biological traits within specific populations who have been classified by race due to economical, educational, and medical disadvantages. By now, you should have a general understanding of where the concept of race came from and where the argument of biological race came from and why it's so wrong. So now I'd like to systematically break down Dr. Isertel's claim from every angle I can think of. By the end of this video, I will have broken down and dispelled the misinformation surrounding each and every argument that I can think of that may be made by someone who foolhardily believes that race is a biological reality. First claim. But skin color is genetic, so those who are black simply have the genetics to be darker skin. Unfortunately, this is a rash oversimplification of skin color as a biological trait. You see, skin color is a polygenic trait, which means that there are many genes that contribute to thousands of different shades of skin color. So even when two different people have the exact same skin color, the genetics that explain why their skin color is the way it is may be completely different. For example, one person may have slightly darker skin due to a slight mutation of the TYR and OGA2 gene, while another person may have the same dark skin tone due to a specific slight mutation of the MC1R and TYRP1 gene. Visually, these two people may look like they have the exact same skin tone or phenotype, but genetically these two people cannot be biologically categorized as the same because they do not share the same genotype. Even if people look similar, you cannot put two people in the same biological category based on their genetics if their genetics are completely different. That's like saying that everyone with brown hair is a part of the same race because they have brown hair, even if the genetics that cause their brown hair are completely different. On top of the genetic complications, in absence of genetic conditions like albinoism, there are not components of skin tone that are completely absent or present from one race to another. Even though eumelanin is considered the dark brown melanin and pheomelanin is considered the light yellow melanin, Africans are not defined by eumelanin and Europeans are not defined by pheomelanin. Both African and European individuals have higher levels of eumelanin when compared to pheomelanin. Those who live in a sunny environment and are exposed to UVB like most Africans simply have darker skin because they have more melanin as a whole due to differences in melanin production or melanosome size. And as I just discussed, there is not a single gene or group of genes that is always responsible for a person having more 
more or less melanin in their skin or having large or small melanosomes. So because there are completely different genetic factors involved in the same skin tones, we cannot group people together into biological categories solely based on the appearance of their skin. Now, the same people who talk about skin color genetics also tend to argue, what about differences in muscularity and skeletal structure? Well, I must begin by clarifying that the genes involved in skin color are not innately or principally attached to the development of muscularity or skeletal structure. In the same way that there exists dark-skinned populations where the majority have a muscular build and dense bones, there exists light-skinned populations where the majority have a muscular build and dense bones. Now, the positive correlation between certain skin colors and certain musculoskeletal builds is simply a byproduct of convenient partnerships and culture. People tend to partner up with non-immediate family members who live closer to them, so the genetics that are involved in muscularity and skeletal structure are more likely to stay close to home or at least within the same region. And if, within that same region, agricultural practices that involve a lot of manual labor and manual labor as a whole is very common, then you're going to find that a muscular build and dense bones are naturally selected for. But all that being said, human beings have not spent enough time away from one another for those genetics to draw deep and pervasive lines between muscularity or skeletal structure in certain races based on skin color. So the same genes that are involved in muscularity and bone density in black individuals are the same genes that are involved in muscularity and bone density in white and yellow individuals. The only difference is the prevalence because some races were either forced to be or socially and culturally more involved in manual labor like farming. And since muscularity and a higher bone density would be advantageous for manual labor like farming, this lends to a higher prevalence of bone density, muscularity, and specific muscularity musculoskeletal builds within certain races. But again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Prevalence does not equal there or not. The underlying genetics to stronger bones, muscularity, and specific skeletal structure do not draw hard lines between races based on skin color. The same genetics that contribute to strong bones in African Americans can be seen in white European Americans. And these similar genetics explain why, without historical context, photos, and cultural artifacts, archaeologists and forensic anthropologists cannot use simply a skeleton or DNA to make strong estimations about what race a person was when they were alive. So this brings me to the question about what about 23andMe? Are they just lying to me about my ethnicity? Yes and no. So as I said, even though the genetics are the same, the prevalence of these traits are different due to culture, enslavement, and the convenience of romantic partnerships, which all play a role in the natural selection of certain traits. However, even though racism motivated some segregation between society due to forced enslavement and the commodification of certain populations, those who got enslaved got assaulted and abused. So genetic traits did not remain isolated within specific populations, even if they were segregated, long enough to form deep and pervasive biological lines. And this likely contributes to why, based on the data, there are actually more genetic differences within Africans than between Africans and Europeans. Companies like 23andMe can make loose estimations about your ethnicity based on loose trends found within ethnic groups. However, it's very important to recognize that loose estimations are not conclusive. 23andMe may claim that you are 1 16th Native American, but if your family is mostly from halfway around the world in Scotland, then you are probably not not Native American. Your genetics just look like they could be Native American. And this brings me to the claim that race can indicate ethnicity, and ethnicity is based on your family, and your family is based on genetics, so ethnicity must be biological and genetic. Again, although there may be a loose trend, a higher low prevalence of genetic traits within racial and ethnic groups, these genetic traits do not define racial and ethnic groups, and the genetics themselves are largely the same if they are found in other races. Moreover, these loose trends are largely disappearing as our society becomes more globally connected and mixed. Since colonialism and the age of conquerors, humans have been mixing and mingling, but now, without the difficulty of traveling from one continent to another, separation between cultures becomes less and less apparent, and so does the separation in our genetics based on ethnicity. In this modern age of airplanes and cars, ethnic separation largely relies on differences in language, which can make it difficult for partners to communicate with one another, but this separation is easily overcome by learning a new language. Overall, since the dawn of human existence, the biological lines that separate different ethnicities have been crossed too many times to count so many times that the biological lines that loosely separate different ethnicities are loose and temporary and mere estimations of what a person's ethnicity truly is. I mean, the moment a mixed baby is born, you get even more complications in how you define ethnic groups as different ethnic genetics mix and mingle. Now, what about the clear genetic differences in athleticism between different racial and ethnic groups? First, that is assuming that those differences are purely genetic. But before I extrapolate on that point, jumping back to my points on muscularity and bone structure, societies that had stronger roots in manual labor, like farming, or were forced enslaved to participate in manual labor were more likely to experience stronger natural selection and environmental 
exposure to promote traits like enhanced muscularity and bone structure. That is true, but this natural selection and environmental pressure was largely driven by social factors such as convenience of partnerships, agricultural practices, and enslavement. And on top of that, because enslaved populations were not necessarily reproductively segregated, humans still mingled with each other from one race to another, there were no pervasive biological lines that divided race based on athleticism or physical capability. But what about certain countries being successful in the Olympics? Well, although genetics, specifically involving actin N3 polymorphisms, can promote athleticism, actin N3 polymorphisms do not define race-associated athleticism because these polymorphisms are present in almost every single race and ethnicity, while the social acceptance of athleticism and sports are not. Basically, a race or ethnicity may have a certain prevalence of certain genetic traits that contribute to athleticism, but only if the society promotes athleticism will that society become exceedingly successful in the Olympics. Remember, you can be genetically blessed, but never train a day in your life. For example, the actin N3 RR genotype is the most strongly associated with fast, powerful movements that aid in sports like sprinting and powerlifting. Control populations of Aboriginal Australians, the Finnish, South African and Caucasian, African Americans, Jamaicans, Russian Caucasians, Ethiopians, and Kenyans all have the highest frequency of this actin N3 RR genotype. But despite high genetic frequency, Aboriginal Australians, the Finnish, and Caucasian Russians are not necessarily known for Olympic sprinting in the same way that African populations are, now are they? So why are Kenyans, Ethiopians, and other Africans so well known for their performance in the Olympics, despite being favored by the same genetics that the Finnish, Aboriginal Australians, and Caucasian Russians have? Countries where money, resources, and traditional jobs are difficult to come by and sustain, participating in a sport which that country is globally known for, like Olympic sprinting and African countries? may be one of the few ways to escape a low socioeconomic hole, so struggling families in these countries are more likely to be supportive of sports like sprinting, especially if they know that Olympic sprinters receive global recognition, sponsorships, and financial bonuses that can thrust their family out of poverty and a low socioeconomic hole. Then on top of all of that, the actin N3 RR genotype is not absent in other populations either. It's just the prevalence, so African populations are not known for the actin N3 RR genotype, they just have a higher prevalence of that genotype. Overall, even though athletic genotypes like the actin N3 RR genotype may be present in higher frequencies in many different countries and populations, you're more likely to find a higher prevalence of athleticism as a whole in countries where sports and athleticism are the way out of a low socioeconomic class. Even though biology can facilitate athleticism, humans have not spent long enough time away from one another to experience large gaping holes in athleticism between different races and ethnicities, and social acceptance is truly what drives athleticism in certain societies. So now that we've dispelled the misconception about race and Athleticism. What about the differences in IQ scores and intelligence between different racial and ethnic groups? Because certain racial and ethnic groups have a lower heritability of intelligence than others. And this is because their skull size is drastically different. Now, these extremely racist myths began in 1839 with Samuel Morton's Crania Americana and continued with Francis Galton, the eugenics movement in Germany, Terman's study of the gifted, and World War I army IQ testing. First, Morton's Crania Americana found significant differences in skull volume, and these differences were used to justify the enslavement of the race with the smallest skull, the Ethiopians. But Morton's methodology was highly susceptible to error and bias as he measured craniocytes by manually filling the crania with pepper seeds. This method likely led to overstuffing the skulls that he wanted to be larger. On top of that, he took away much of the variation within the Ethiopian race by using far less, over 20 less Ethiopian skulls than Caucasian skulls. So not only did he overstuff Caucasian skulls, he likely also chose the larger Caucasian skulls when compared to the Ethiopian sample. Combining this error-prone methodology and a faulty sample size, Morton's data was inherently flawed. As race became a more rooted social construct in our society and as science advanced, we learned that socioeconomic status plays a massive role in health status as a higher socioeconomic status allows for better health education, more time and effort towards optimizing physical activity levels, and more money and opportunities for healthier eating habits. Unsurprisingly, a higher health status also contributes to larger brain sizes, particularly in developing children. But again, by this point, race has already become a very rooted social social construct in our society. So through racial discrimination and segregation, individuals of particular races got stuck in lower socioeconomic statuses. And this is ultimately why racial differences in pre-adolescent brain outcomes are completely mitigated by household income. Basically, the higher the household income, the higher the socioeconomic status, and the more that racial differences begin to disappear. This all really truly demonstrates how social factors like racial discrimination can contribute to health disparities, which play a much larger role in race biology than our natural biology itself. And to really nail the whole brain size, 
size based on race myth in the coffin, it is objectively more difficult to go from poor to rich than from rich to richer. So it is not surprising that populations that experienced historical racial discrimination, such as African American populations, were put at a socioeconomic disadvantage and experienced health disparities due to reduced job opportunities, lower pay, and less respect or social status. But when socioeconomic status is higher, racial differences begin to disappear. So none of these things were due to race biology, but social discrimination that resulted in health disparities. Now moving on from skull size and brain volume to intelligence, Terman was a proponent of eugenics, and he argued that there were enormously significant racial differences in genetic intelligence. This all motivated the scar rao hypothesis, which indirectly claimed that the heritability of intelligence was lower in particular races, causing those races to be subjected to a lower socioeconomic status. Fortunately, Terman and Rao were both abhorrently wrong. When socioeconomic status is accounted for, racial differences in childhood brain outcomes and IQ scores are not significantly different, and the heritability of intelligence as a whole is not significantly different between different races. Ultimately, correlation does not equal causation, and without accounting for the very pervasive social variables that drastically impact health outcomes, you cannot make sweeping racist claims about brain development and intelligence based on race. Moving on, I've heard from quite a few race biology realists that there are different subspecies of human beings like wolves, and skin color is a feature of these subspecies. Unfortunately, this cannot be true because, as I've stated several times now, human beings have not spent long enough time away from one another to actually develop large, pervasive, deep differences in our biology. Unlike different subspecies of dogs or wolves, which mingle within their subspecies, resulting in larger, pervasive differences in their biology when compared to other subspecies, human beings mingle with one another no matter what skin color or musculoskeletal build. As a result, human beings are more comparable to different colored huskies or different colored wolves of the same subspecies. Through the same breed or subspecies of dog or wolf, they just have different colored fur or eyes. Human beings are not only the same species, they are the same subspecies and breed. They just have different colored skin, hair, and eyes. There are too many mixed babies and too many mixed populations for us to definitively define separate subspecies and breeds of human. By now you may be noticing a pattern in my responses to these claims. The biological lines that could have existed between ethnicity were crossed so many times that race and ethnicity now are just loose categories that have only persisted due to social factors like cultural language and discrimination, which have resulted in socioeconomic and health disparities. And these disparities cannot be due to biological race because biological race lines have been crossed so many times since the dawn of human existence. While we can draw general associations with race, there will always be exceptions that are not just outliers, but a whole percentage of a given population. This percentage between 5, 10, 15, or 20 percent prevents definitive racial and ethnic biological categories. And even with general associations between biology and race or ethnicity, you must consider the cultural and social factors that may have contributed to the development of these traits and features because in reality, only the prevalence of biology and genetics differ from one culture of humans to the next, not the actual biological underpinnings of these traits. Ultimately, race and ethnicity are certainly real socially, but they do not have a true biological reality. Race may be socially influential, but race does not draw deep, pervasive biological dividers. Overall, after all of this, Dr. Mike is not literate because he believes that race is a biological construct with deep, pervasive biological consequences. In fact, the complete opposite would be true. The claim that race is a biological construct with deep, pervasive biological consequences is not only extremely illiterate, but an outdated racist claim when confronted with our current understanding of genetics and a comprehensive interpretation of the data and scientific literature as a whole. While I do not know if Dr. Mike is knowingly being racist in this video, the claims he is supporting are racist, and this shows me that Dr. Mike is not truly illiterate in the field of genetics and biology as he claims to be. All that being said, I do hope that Dr. Mike Isertel comes to find this video to learn about the truth about race. All right, now that we've come to the end of this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below some more things you'd like me to react to or comment on.